Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, and uh, for those of you who are in the audience, thank you for coming all the way to San Antonio, and for those of you who are watching us virtually, uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day uh, to uh, watch this award. I really can't thank the organizers enough for uh, bestowing me with this honor. I, here's my disclosure. And uh, what's really important uh, when you win an award that is most coveted in breast cancer is to think about why and why you and why this moment. And so this moment, I really want to use it to celebrate families because during this pandemic, we've all had to either love our families uh, or be really sad because we miss our families. And my mother passed this year, but I was able to spend a lot of time with her because I got vaccinated. She got vaccinated over the age of 101 and we celebrated moments together. But not everyone had the opportunity to do that and we lost too many people because COVID was not kind to cancer patients and a lot of people who are poor or live in low resource settings do not have access to vaccines. So I'm using this platform to plead for those who have not been vaccinated to please go and get vaccinated. And then for those who don't believe in genetics, to actually know that I also know that genetics can do a little bit, but there's a nurturing. And so this is why this is devoted to my parents who really worked very hard to nurture that girl child. And that was me uh, around 1966. And uh, really looking as missionaries to have a doctor in the family. And so I serve as a doctor for my family. And of course, nobody in my family believes anything that I say. But I do believe in science and I'm inspired by science uh, because I know that in fact, there's certain things that happen that are transformational. Uh, so when AACR asked me to pick the most important paper of the past century since publication of cancer research, I picked Bill Maguire's paper because I thought this was really transformative for breast cancer research. It was the enduring legacy of Bill Maguire that gets all of us as breast cancer researchers thinking always about the estrogen receptor. Of course, I, I did my training at the University of Chicago. Charles Huggins actually taught me when he was 92 on mammary carcinogenesis because there's no one who goes through University of Chicago without learning from the great Dr. Charlie Hoggins. And he hadn't died by the time I was there. And this paper only had 145 patients. And after mastectomy, which was what everybody got in those days, he made the observation that there was a subset of women, about 37% of them who were ER negative based on measuring proteins by femtomoles, and they tended to be younger, and that these younger women, usually under the age of 50, had very high rates of recurrence. As a medical oncologist, you know your Kaplan-Meier. When it diverges like that, you know that there's a difference in prognosis. And I went to look at the database at the University of Chicago to see what was going on between ER positive and ER negative breast cancer. And it was really a transformative moment in my life. And I'll come back to that. But what I ended up doing was to think about the heterogeneity of breast cancer and heterogeneity of populations who get breast cancer. And because I started really thinking more about genetics, not about signaling, 
and I was at a university where Dr. Janet Rowley was the leading figure in risk-adapted use of genomics or genetics and cytogenetics to cure leukemia and lymphoma, it was clear that I had no chance of studying leukemia and lymphoma. So the only thing I could do was to go to solid tumor. And in solid tumor, it was difficult to study the genetics. And the only thing that was really exciting at that time was germline genetics. How can we bring the advances in germline genetics to the clinic? And so to me at that time, it was like being a witchcraft uh, a, a, a practitioner because we were thinking about prognosticating, predicting, because we believe that in fact it's possible to preempt cancer and to prevent cancer. And so I opened a shop and that was my cancer risk clinic and people were asked to come in because I wanted to use them to understand the genetic basis of cancer in general but really it was the women who came, women and their family members, women who were concerned. And so I ended up really spending a lot of my time thinking about women and their families. And since I'm in Texas, women are really, really important. And I asked the question, are people dying prematurely because we link advancing age with risk of cancer? do not have appropriate tools for risk assessment and have not trained the workforce to accelerate progress in cancer control and prevention. Why did I begin to think about cancer control and prevention? Because I knew it was too expensive to make sure everyone had access to bone marrow transplant, which was what we were using to cure breast cancer at that time. And I kept thinking, could we do this faster, cheaper, and would that really help us to make broaden access for everyone? And so my first patient was a black woman, 34 year old, who presented with no negative, uh, triple negative breast cancer. She had lumpectomy and radiation followed by adriamycin containing adjuvant therapy. She invited me to our family reunion and followed by extensive interactions with multiple family members. And what you will notice about this pedigree, for those of you who do uh, genetics, you will know that there's a broker pedigree that was published in 1896, and that's what everybody uh, publishes. But I'm proud to publish this five generation pedigrees of strong black women, all of them originating from the South, but they kept their family history and they all came to the uh, appointment with my uh, proban. Unfortunately, after she got treated with adriamycin, developed cardiomyopathy, not only did she have toxicity from the treatment, she also had financial toxicity, lost her insurance and could no longer be treated by me. And with a low ejection fraction, even after we eventually found the BRCA1 mutation in her family, she couldn't have her ovaries out and she ended up dying from ovarian cancer. That was about the time that Mary Claire King and I became really good friends because she helped me publish this paper of extended African-American families with BRCA1 and uh, uh, mutations. They had not been studied because there were not too many of them, they were part of the Breast Cancer Linkage Consortium. Now, Mary Claire King was getting the National Science Medal from uh, President Barack Obama, who also really helped me think about personalized medicine. So why is this important? It's important because shortly after identifying BRCA1, my good friend, another uh, 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 person who came through uh, University of uh, Chicago, that's Chuck Peru, and of course Jeff Trent, who was working at the National Cancer Institute, looked at gene expression profiling. We had the tools, we could look at th thousands of genes, and was immediately able to show that BRCA1 mutation carriers tend to have aggressive ER negative breast cancer. And it was quite distinct from BRCA2 carriers. Uh, this is hierarchical clustering. This is really trying to separate uh, 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 and, and cluster people based on their genetic mutation. 
And I had the audacity to write uh, uh, an editorial to the New England Journal saying, well, this is not really about BRCA1 and 2. It's just about being ER negative. Um, some of that was partly true. But what was really compelling to me was that even the one uh, uh, person who was not properly identified had a BRCA1 methylated tumor. It was not a germline mutation, but they had somatic methylation. And thereby telling me that in fact, you may not have a, a germline mutation, but you could actually have environmental influences that will get you to methylate or to have epigenetic changes that disrupted your BRCA uh, functioning. So that was very important to me. And then I began to think about the importance of getting to the root of breast cancer heterogeneity by doubling down and studying black women across the African diaspora. Because we have different patterns of migration. Uh, some came, like me, as new immigrants to America. Some were forcibly removed out of Africa during the slave trade, and they came through a lot of hardship before getting to the Americas. And so whenever we start talking about black, it becomes a really challenging question because the question is black by social determinant because you have a drop of blood, which was sort of how people were categorized. And so how much African ancestry makes you black or is it the culture that makes you black? And so we can debate this back and forth, but every time I see a 23andMe uh, ad asking me to buy uh, the 23 and make it, and then putting Gale on and saying, oh, now I'm Nigerian, I would say, no, 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 the genes don't make you quite Nigerian, right? You may have ancestry, but there's a lot that culture, that food, that geography really has to do with epigenetic regulation. And so that's why when we talk about the global South, when we talk about countries in South America, when we talk about Hispanics and we talk about what is your ancestry, when we talk about uh, women in Bahia, in Brazil, where after the slave trade, they didn't leave uh, as uh, Brazil, they stayed there, they kept their culture. And the first time I got to Brazil, I was like, these are my long lost relatives because they are definitely Yorubas. So what does it make you uh, black or white? I think we can debate that. But what I was really concerned about was the injustice in genetics and the fact that black women have the highest death rate from breast cancer and remained understudied. So I then set off to really continue to collaborate with Chalk uh, my first postdoc was Dijon Ho. Uh, we wanted to start a, uh, a, a Nigerian breast cancer study. Uh, had lots of uh, postdocs, two postdocs that came from Brazil, uh, uh, another uh, a clinical fellow from me. And these uh, fellows did a lot of work in my lab doing clinical annotation, cleaning up, and making sure everyone we saw that we actually got information about their tumor. And then, of course, over time, we've collaborated with um, uh, uh, testing laboratories to do different uh, types of sequencing because we were interested in really asking the question, do breast tumors from different ancestral populations have similar genomic properties and evolutionary trajectory? So why is that important? It's important because when we talk about uh, Africa, Africa is not one country. Being black is not one thing because it's the color of the skin. Uh, but we all came out of Africa. And so when you look at the genetic diversity and you start from South Africa and look at relatedness of African populations, you can see how diverse they are and how they have actually out of, out, after the out of Africa migration, you can see that the, um, um, the European ancestry and uh, Asian ancestry groups uh, really form a different tree in terms of the human uh, 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 phrene phonetic tree. So why is that important? Well, whenever we're talking about heterogeneity of risk factors, we also have to think about what's happening in these different uh, countries, different geographies, different level of development. Uh, some will say low resource or no resource uh, countries. 
Well, women still have lots of children. My mother had six children. That's protective for breast cancer. They have later age at menarche. It's protective. They have high levels of breastfeeding. And that's the only way they have birth control pills because they just pace their children. My mother had children every three years for 20 years of her life and lived to be 102 without ever getting breast cancer. There's no way I can match that. Right? <laughs> So, so then we see this generation gap between our mothers and the next new generation of, of women. And so then we're talking about high rates of young onset breast cancer globally, not just in the US. Because in our studies in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the median age at diagnosis is 47 years. Uh, there is higher risk of aggressive ER negative breast cancer. And because people are not aware of, uh, of breast cancer, even when they show up to their doctors, they don't get diagnosed. They think it's just a, a, a galactosil. It's because they have mastitis. And of course, my mother had mastitis when she had my sister because women get infected and they have mastitis. But most of those mastitis resolve with antibiotics. But periodically, you have pregnancy-associated breast cancer, and these women take antibiotics for two years before the breast cancer is finally diagnosed. So my student went to Nigeria to ask these women what was the problem, and it turned out they didn't delay coming to their doctor. It's just that the doctors misdiagnosed them and gave them antibiotics for two years. So we learned something by going out there. Then we started thinking about doing sequencing to figure out why these women are getting uh, 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 exposure that was causing them to have ear negative breast cancer. And for those of you who are not genomicists, who do not sequence, we have lots of things that actually tell us uh, about DNA sequence changes that can tell us something about the cancer or the etiology of the cancer. Many of you know cervical cancer is caused by HPV. In a lot of countries, cervical cancer is still the number one cancer for women. And stomach cancer used to be a major cancer uh, when, before we had antibiotics. It turns out it's H. pylori. So globally, there's importance in trying to figure out what's causing the rate, high rates of uh, and expanding uh, increases in breast cancer. So lots of these things now are fixed in somatic mutations that we now have access to. We're all going to be sequencing a lot, and I hope that by sequencing, we're beginning to think about metagenesis and cancer development. We'll come back to immune response, uh, to infection, and why, in fact, maybe what we will be doing in the future is vaccinating all our patients against cancer. So by doing this type of work and doing exome sequencing from samples that we were able to get from TCGA uh, and also uh, from our Nigerian uh, uh, samples, we then began to look at P53. Everyone knows P53 is an important guardian of the genome. Uh, but what was surprising to us was GATA3. We frequently thought about GATA3 as being important for estrogen responsiveness and for uh, ER positive breast cancer. And yet, these women had ER negative breast cancer. And of course, they had fewer PIK3CA mutation and CDH1 mutation. They had more frequent structural variations and then increased activity of the homologous recombination deficiency mutation and signature. And depending on what we used at ER cutoff, we've had debates. The original paper measured uh, a protein and used femtomoles. But in oncology, we've gone from 10% positivity to 1% positivity. And of course, there's a clear difference between a tumor that is abundantly 100% ER positive versus PR negative. I mean, so all sorts of combination of ER expression. And that's really telling us something about heterogeneity. But what we, had, uh, we were seeing is that it didn't matter whether this were ER positive or ER negative, they had HRD mutation as signature using exome sequencing. That was not satisfying for us. And uh, I happen to be married to a pulmonologist who happens to think that everywhere I went, 
I got allergic because I sneeze. I, my, our daughter has asthma, so we're always looking for things that can get, give you a uh, uh, runny nose. However, when we started really collaborating and working together, it was before Chicago cleaned up its art. There was so much uh, air pollution in the city, and Chicago had the highest death rate for black children with asthma. And so we, I'm talking about breast cancer, and he's concerned about why are black children dying from asthma, and was talking about how the allergy revs up your immune system. So we decided to go to Nigeria and to continue to ask the, the question about what is actually driving uh, the, uh, uh, the, the increased rate of asthma. Is it the exposure at home or is it really uh, the fact that this, you know, there, there's a whole so-called hygiene hypothesis. And by proposing the hygiene hypothesis, we realized that it wasn't anything about hygiene. It was actually that these indi individuals were more exposed to household air pollution and is a burning biomass, burning dirty fuel, you know, everything related to climate change that was making this an important problem for black children in Chicago as well as young children all over the world. Four million children die from household air pollution. When he told me that, I almost fainted. But it is true. And what was even more compelling was as the consortium of asthma among African ancestry populations began doing their work, they suddenly realized that when they sequenced whole genomes of people from Africa, there was 10%, 296 million bases more DNA than the current human reference genome. So when this paper was published, when Dr. Salzberg called me and said, oh, do you know if this patient had malaria or other infections? Because we see things that are not in the reference genome. I said, yeah, malaria is endemic, but Think about your alignment. So this year, we've all been talking about algorithms. We've talk, been talking about genomic assays that do not work for everybody. So why is that important? So as we dug down and we started doing whole genome sequencing of tumor normal pairs from Nigeria, we started really being able to have better def definition of what we call homologous recombination deficiency signature. Yes, with exome sequencing, with panel sequencing, you see the tip of the iceberg, and you can use SBS3 signature. But you need to think about double-based substitution, and then the indel, the deletions, and the structural arrangements, all are very important, and all really need to be looked at uh, when you are thinking about genomic classifier. So we put a genomic classifier to, to task, and for those of you who don't dream of this every day like I do, just look at the patterns. And this is what is really nice about this moment in time where we have bioinformatics and we have computational biologists who can just show me patterns, right? By pattern recognition, we were able to not only uh, find those individuals who have HRD signature, uh, we were able to look at uh, uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 that's really separate from uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the other uh, 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 HRD uh, uh, signature that was just one uh, other HRD. But most of those individuals had a uh, germline uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, or PALB2. And this is a beautiful way to actually uh, define HRD. And we can go on and on about what is going to be the best uh, assay to go forward. But this is the beauty of research. You continue to refine your tools, you refine your algorithms, and hopefully you can do uh, randomized clinical trials using the appropriate biomarkers. But we're now really excited to now go back and say, how about the germline? That's what we really wanted to, to find out. Well, this is Mary Claire King who said, let's go and, and, and sequence a thousand breast cancer cases from Nigeria and a thousand controls and see how many of them have BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALB2. 
Let's not stop there. Let's go to Cameroon and Uganda and then get some cases from Brazil. And wherever we went across the diaspora that was really enriched for black women who were from West Africa, we saw high rates of BRCA1 and mutations in these genes. And look at the age of onset. They were all under the age of 50 and they were enriched for ER negative breast cancer. If you compare to African Americans, average age of 55, or even the uh, uh, carrier study, which is more than 30,000 white women and 30,000 controls, we didn't need 30,000 women to see this signal because these are older women. These were probably overdiagnosed ER pro uh, pro uh, uh, positive breast cancer and not the aggressive breast cancer that's going to kill you before the age of 50. So we then go on and ask about how are these mutations evolving? Uh, do they all evolve along the same trajectory? What are the early events? Because you did genome uh, analysis, you can actually measure the trajectory of breast cancer. So what are we looking for to do better models? Is, it, is everything inherited or is it a gene environment interactions? Are we using the wrong models? What are the epigenetic changes? So lots of questions that we need to continue to answer. And right now, we're bringing a lot of things to the clinic, but they might exacerbate health disparity because of this uh, really uh, distinct uh, evolution between a pure African ancestry where we're 99.9% .9 identical and then how the genome has really diverged as people have moved to different countries. So this is why it's really important that we begin to do cross ancestry uh, analysis that we pull our resources. Uh, Ade Dokun just published this paper where we are finding more GWAS hits by focusing on women of African ancestry. We're trying to uh, look at overall uh, breast cancer risk and develop a PRS that works for women of African ancestry, especially women with ER negative breast cancer. We did an education session yesterday where we talked about where the, are the tools and how do we do risk assessment. If you have a 4% risk of ER negative breast cancer, what are you going to do about it? So these are questions that I think we can answer as we begin the next step. This is what we're going to do with a wisdom study. And this is my favorite uh, photo of my favorite person, uh, Laura Esserman, wrapped around uh, uh, the Nigerian flag, but looking at all the other flags in Africa at, uh, at the African Organization for Research and Training in Cancer meeting. So the, we, there's so much we can do. And even though Wisdom is trying to, re, to recruit 70,000 women, women come from different countries, different backgrounds. We probably need more than 70,000 to be able to really answer the question about risk-based versus annual and randomized or self-selection. So for all of you who are here, who have not signed up for Wisdom, please sign up. I have, and I hope more of you will do it. Because what is really important now for us uh, when it comes to risk assessment and risk prediction is who needs an MRI, right? It's not a question about getting bilateral mastectomy anymore. At our education session yesterday and over 20 years of looking at screening versus bilateral mastectomy, we know there's no difference in overall survival. What really matters is when did you know of your mutation status and what did you do about it? And if you want to do something about it and you have young, dense breasts, we can pick up your cancer when it's six millimeter. This is what Dr. Deepa Sheth and my team at the University of Chicago are pushing to do it. So more is more, semi-annual breast MRI screening in BRCA1 mutation carriers. We can start it before the age of 40. And these women will come because they want to make sure they have a chance to uh, uh, get their cancers diagnosed. And then, of course, the question is, how do we improve treatment uh, outcomes for all patients? I want to thank Rita for taking my first idea about platinum. This is so compelling. BRCA1 mutation carriers given platinum. They did well. You can see that Kaplamaya curve. Chemotherapy works. It's just sometimes by the time we give it, it's too late. So 
uh, uh, my uh, medical student is going to be presenting uh, uh, results from iSpy, where we're looking at immune signatures. And it doesn't matter how you get to paths here. It's not about the race. It's about the genomic assay that gets you into a clinical trial. Because if you get a, a, a path CR, you're doing well. There's no racial disparity when you get new adjuvant therapy and you do well. If you don't get a path CR, then you start seeing disparity. And black women, of course, uh, do worse because they're not driven by ER positive breast cancer signaling that we have all been studying. And it's not all triple negative breast cancer. Some of it is Lumina B breast cancer and HO2 positive breast cancer. So we've now been really doing a lot of work to understand immune signatures and immune pathways, uh, looking at uh, epigenetic changes. And this is really one of the GWAS hits uh, that our lab is studying. We can, you know, knock in the gene, knock it out, look at its uh, pattern of expression. TNSF10 uh, codes for trail. And we've all been really looking at how uh, TNFS uh, uh, 10 expression is regulated by antiviral innate signaling and not by TNF alpha signaling. And this is important. This was a genome wide uh, hit, and we see all of this uh, uh, differential expression based on the SNP, the genotype that you have. And uh, so the cytokines that your tumor puts into the tumor microenvironment might be altered depending on your SNP. So these are all important concepts that we can now study because we have at least a, a, a hypothesis around uh, differences uh, that are driven by your genetics. So let me uh, end and just summarize that we've gone from stratifying everybody uh, based on clinical features, uh, subtypes, whether they're poor, whether they're low resource, whether they have insurance or don't have insurance, we blame the patient for their own disparity. Uh, but I think right now we need to start really talking about precision healthcare for all. Uh, and it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in the US, there's in country disparity and uh, uh, across country disparity. And as a breast cancer organization with international members, we all have to really get together in solidarity to begin to think about actionable germline mutation somatic alterations, targeted therapies, and screening, and prevention, uh, or cancer interception. So my take home message really is I'm so, uh, so thrilled that I've been given this award. Uh, I, it's been a wonderful journey to go from thinking about what to do with BRCA1 to now actually having D BRCA1 DNA repair pathways maybe four, five, so many gene, uh, new drugs that we can use to target uh, mutation carriers, to target the immune landscape. And, uh, and we can really think about what we need to do to develop PRS that works in all populations because we are one human race. And we need to broaden global access to innovative biomarker-informed clinical trials in all communities, not just where you have a lot of wealthy white women. So let's thank my collaborators. I have fun. I'm not leaving Chicago ever because my surgeons, my radiologists, my, all of us, we support a women's basketball team. And we won this year. So go Chicago. We start another reign of Michael Jordan, which was really what happened when I first got to Chicago. And uh, I really want to thank my colleagues uh, and, of course, my team in Africa who are doing a lot of work to help us get patients into clinical trials. And, of course, my children who inspire me every day because they always say, Mom, you're the slowest. You're not going to get to the summit of Kilimanjaro. But you know what? When you pace yourself and you know that you're trying to get to the mountain top, sometimes you actually get there. So thank you all for uh, uh, coming. And I thank uh, the organizers, the committee for selecting me. And I thank my patients, uh, my funders, uh, the companies that I've started because my daughter uh, inspired me. And uh, I, I, none of this is ever possible without an amazing team of people in my lab and people in our breast program. 
And of course, patients uh, who came forward, who gave us their blood to study the genetics, and families who are coming to each one of you in your practices and expecting you to help them. So thank you all.